Okay, now, great, fantastic. Now we are into the third round of our conversation and this is going to be rapid conscious choice. I'm not going to call it unconscious because then you might actually say that it was unconscious and therefore not you will not take any responsibility. So I'm going to give you two choices. You will have to pick one and you'll have to very briefly explain maybe in one sentence or maximum two sentences why you chose what you chose. So choice number one or question number one. Man or woman? Woman. Why? Possibility. You will have to explain this. <laughs> <laughs> if you can be so if you can be so brief, I'll be entitled to be <laughs> equally curt. No, you you explain it. Uh, I, I want the explanation. Right. You said possibility. Possibility. You see, when you say man and woman. Man or woman. Uh, man and woman. Classically, both are just prakriti. So both come under the, the umbrella name of woman, hmm? which is the human state, which is the human state. In some sense, all of us are women. You are a woman in, 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 in just the biological sense. I too am a woman in the mental sense, right? So the word woman describes entire mankind. So you could say womankind. <laughs> Okay. Right? okay. So the possibility of redemption is there only to the woman. Who else will have that possibility? So a woman, you know, is, uh, is used as a metaphor for, uh, uh, for the one who is seeking her beloved. Huh? So that's the mind. The mind uh, seeking peace. So, I would want to remember that we all are that unfulfilled conscious, uncon consciousness, uh, which is that we all are that, uh, that woman who is uh, seeking the ultimate beloved, in that sense, possibility. Desire or renunciation? Desire. Explain. Des the fundamental thing is love. Love is the highest desire. It is only when you desire the highest that you will have the guts or, uh, or the daring to drop the lowly things which you call as renunciation. So renunciation can never come first. Krishna in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita talks of Karma Yoga and Karma Sanyas and he says they are ideally the same thing but uh, practically Karma yoga is preferable to karma sannyas, which is much the same as saying that love takes precedence over renunciation or that love is the mother of renunciation. If you are in love, you will without even knowing drop a lot of nonsense and you will become a renunciate and you won't even know that. So love will bring about renunciation at the same time renunciation without love, won't last and would become some kind of hypocrisy. Osho or J. Krishnamurti? J. Krishnamurti. Explain. Purity. You will have to explain that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the, the higher you go, the purer you need to be. Hmm? Methods and uh, tactics are all great when you have just begun the climb. But uh, the same thing that assists you to climb at uh, the lower altitudes becomes a burden against climbing when you have reached the heights at higher altitudes. So, Krishnamurti has an unparalleled purity. No methods, no distractions, no this and that. A very dedicated concentration on nothing but the truth. Hmm? And uh, 
And that's the reason I said uh, JK over Osho. At the same time, I have great respect for Osho. Hmm? And uh, I think he can be very useful to those who are, uh, who are just beginning their journey. But as you ascend, it is uh, Krishna Murti that you will need to seek. Krishna or Shiva? <clears throat> There's much the same. No, no, no choices there. But because these days, you know, it's, it's a topical thing. Because these days I am with the Bhagavad Gita, so I'll say Krishna. On another day, I would have equally said Shiva. So, explain to us that why are they e are, are the same thing and why Shiva today and Shiva tomorrow? Krishna today and Shiva tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, Krishna. Oh, nothing. That's a mood, a fleeting mood, a fleeting movement. I mean, just yesterday I conducted a session on the Bhagavad Gita and tomorrow I think there is another one. So, it's just a human thing that Krishna is in the top of the mind. Uh, otherwise, there is no difference between Krishna and uh, Shiv. There have been uh, phases when I have found myself uh, immensely in love with, uh, uh, with just the word Shiv. In fact, in fact, just half an hour before you came, uh, we had the head of the uh, books department uh, with us and because Mahashivratri is approaching, she drew my attention to one of our old books, uh, Om Namah Shivai, and I said, rename it Shivoham. That becomes important because Mahashivratri happens to be my birthday. So, in a very carnal way, uh, I have a bit of a connection with Shiv, which is nothing but a very carnal connection, does not mean much. Uh, Krishna and Shiva are one. You see, Krishna, as he speaks in the Gita, speaks as pure truth hmm? and Shiv is another name again for the highest consciousness possible. So Krishna and Shiv are, are just the same. Someday you will feel like saying Krishna, someday Shiv and there are days when I just love to say Ram. Lakshmi so, or Saraswati? Saraswati, obviously. I don't even need to explain I suppose. So they are not one? No, they are not one. Why? Learning and, and wealth cannot be one, obviously. But at the same time, if you want to go deeper into it, if you pick up the Durga Sapchati, there, both Lakshmi and Saraswati are simply two names for the mother goddess. If you want to go there, then I'll say just as I can't pick between Krishna and Shiv, I cannot pick between Lakshmi and Saraswati. But if you want to take, uh, if you want to accord the popular meanings to their names, right? Then uh, Lakshmi stands for wealth and all. Saraswati stands for wisdom. Wisdom any day over wealth. Eastern philosophy or Western philosophy? Eastern. Why? I. Explain. <laughs> Western philosophy is relatively uh, puts relatively lesser emphasis on who you are there is there is a lot of ideation uh, there is a very honest and laborious exploration of man's condition society economics but uh, the the purity and uh, rigor that Vedanta uh, displays in coming to man's fundamental identity and then declaring that liberation uh, from all the identities that you hold is the very purpose of life. That is something that you do not uh, find in Western philosophy. In fact, nowhere in Western philosophy do you find the word mukti liberation. There is knowledge, there is exploration, there is realization and I'm, I'm, I'm fond of Western philosophy, right? I'm not deprecating uh, one over the other, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I love Western philosophy, I want to go deeper into it, uh, but uh, liberation is something the West does not talk of. Huh? So. 
India or world? How can you have India without the world? <laughs> so, so that, that becomes just too hypothetical. But again, as, as, a, as someone sitting in India, right, I would uh, simply say India. But when I say India again, my India is uh, not a political unit, not a geographical location, not a piece of land. When I say India, I, I refer to the place, to the set of conditions that uh, enabled man for the first time to both look towards the sky and into himself. Hmm? So that's the India that I love, uh, the, the, the India of self-knowledge. Life or death? Death. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> that which we call as life must be put to death. And only then does real life begin. So there's a life after death. No, no, not after death. When you say after, you mean a flow of time. Huh? So at 4 p.m., life as we know it ended. And at 5 p.m., you had an afterlife. I'm not talking of that. I'm talking of a certain beyondness. I'm saying that this eating, uh, talking, walking, mating, this is what we consider as life, right? When we are able to transcend this definition of life, then we really come alive. So let this life be put to death and then uh, there is joy uh, and uh, the fear of death is gone. And the Upanishads say that is what is immortality when the fear of death is gone. This that we call is life. It is always in the shadow of death. No, We are always afraid of things coming to an end in some way or the other. So this life is no good because in this life there is always the fear of death. This has to be exceeded. This has to be transcended. That's why I said death. I said death so that we may come alive. Now the last segment. I am going to ask you about your first and the last love, which is books. Give us five books that you have loved all your life. Depends on the audience segment. Suggest me an audience segment. Well, on... On love, on enlightenment. Okay, on one book sun. each on these? Yes. On enlightenment uh, for beginners, uh, Siddharth by Herman Hess. Love. Narad Bhakti Sutra. On science. Oh, several. You could have. Uh, Feynman lecture on uh, physics, you could have uh, the Hawkins book on time, um, several books, but I, would, but I would say stick to your textbooks. That's where you, you get science from. Science you just cannot read. Science without mathematics means nothing. So when we say science, there has to be an exercise book, a notebook by your side where you keep solving equations. Science is not just literature. Hmm? Name a book on women. Ayn Rand's We the Living. Name a book on sex. Specifically on sex. There are so many books that touch upon sex. I, uh, yes. Of Human Bondage, Somerset Mom. Name a book on Indian literature. That uh, encapsulate Indian literature. Mm -hmm. Or maybe an Indian fiction. Indian fiction. Shekhar Ek Jeevni by Agye. Thank you so much for this fascinating, enlightening discussion. I hope uh, we can carry on once again, probably in future, 
for another conversation and for more love. Wonderful.